We will be talking about whatever is on your mind. And uh, I have a few uh, opening comments that I would like to make while I am waiting for you to call in. Uh, The first one, I suppose, would be I'd like to uh, draw your attention to our homepage. On the right-hand column there, uh, on the right-hand column, you'll see a, uh, a little a little module that is entitled, Where Are You? And then there's a little image there that says, Where Are We? And uh, this is something that we just began on Sunday night. We've already had 25 of our listeners sign on, but it's uh, it's what it is, it's a map of the world with a satellite imaging. And and what happens is when you, when you sign your name in, when you type your name in and your zip code, it'll put a little balloon there and show us where you are on the map. And so I would like to invite you, those of you who are listening live, and also those of you that will be listening via the uh, the downloadable version of the MP3, I would like you to go ahead and sign up, show us where you're at, so that I can uh, just get an idea of, of who's out there. Otherwise, I have no idea who's, who's out there unless you actually call in and talk to me. Uh, the number, once again, is 1-800-466-1873. Uh, we also have a Sunday evening program that you may not be aware of that is entitled The Atheist Hour. And we've been having different atheists on throughout the... Uh, we've been having different atheists on throughout the uh, uh, the months now that we've started. We started this a couple months ago. And we would like to uh, invite you to come back and listen on Sunday night. And so Sunday night at 6 p.m. we have The Atheist Hour. Uh, it can also be found at Unchained, unchainedradio.com. Uh, we've, what else can we talk about here? I notice uh, one of our listeners put down here, let me, let me, let me find it real quick. Uh, he put a question on here. I've never even heard, oh yeah, here it is right here. He says his name is Richard Carolus from Lake Zurich, looks like Lake Zurich, Illinois. He says, is anyone here for agrarianism? What is agrarianism? I have no idea what agrarianism is. So I'm going to stick that in Google and find out. what. Does anybody know what agra- agrarian, agra- agrarianism is? Uh, well, it's a term that's found in the Catholic Encyclopedia. Uh, the Latin word agrarius was applied historically to laws or their partisans favoring the division of Roman public lands among poorer citizens. So the English word agrarianism or agrarian generally imply theories and movements intended to benefit the poorer classes of society by dealing in some way with the ownership of land or the legal obligations of the cultivators. Well, I guess you learn something every day. Interesting. Uh, No, I'm not into agrarianism. But if you want to give your land to the poor, that's great. That sounds good to me. All right, let's go to our first caller. Looks like we've got Derek Sansone calling from Dallas, Texas. Derek, welcome to The Narrow Mind. I told Noah he's fired for hanging up on me. Yeah, well, guess what? (laughs) Uh, that, that That is a possibility because now Noah is actually earning money doing this. Oh, really? Yeah. Cool. I, I guess that beats mowing lawns, doesn't it? Well, it's a little bit easier, but uh, <laughs> I, I fronted him some money to buy a skateboard, and, oh, uh, cool. and so he's already in the hole. So if he loses this job, he's got big problems. Wow. Well, cool. Hey, uh, I wanted to talk to you. Uh, see that. I wanted to talk to you about <clears throat> one of my favorite new passages in this whole issue concerning election and the ridicule of those who are not who are unregenerate. Um, let's go to your Bibles, folks, and open up 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Um, in it, uh, Paul is addressing the apostles. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with that. Um, I have the, the NIV in front of me, um, the actual physical Bible, the Bible that I used when I was a believer, and I also have um, BibleGateway.com, so I'm not sure which uh, verse or um, Bible you are going to use to uh, reference me with uh, with this, what are you going to use? I, ge- I generally l- use the uh, the New NASB? American Standard. Yeah, the NASB. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We call that the NASB in Texas. Um, well, we call well, yours well, the nearly inspired version. Nearly inspired. <laughs> nearly, nearly inspired. Cool. Um, let's look up the passage on there. What verse are we talking about, Derek? First uh, Corinthians four seven. 
Okay. And this is real important here for all you reformers that are calling people fools and morons for having a contrast in the conclusions regarding the biblical propositions, especially ones that uh, refer to the gospel prosper, uh, proper. Um, uh, do you want me to read it? Do you want to read it? You have yeah, a, you can, a you can read it. I, I've, got a big, I've got a big star next to this verse, and I've got it underlined, so I'm oh, very good, familiar with it. Oh, good, good. Go, you, go you, ahead. Go ahead. You go ahead and read it. Okay. It says, uh, For who regards you as superior, and what do you have that you did not receive? But if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? That's it. That's it, yeah. I love that verse. <clears throat> what do you think that's saying? I'm, I'm just trying to see where, where you where you hold on, where you stand on well, that. Well, I, I think that... Star by it. Yeah, I think that's saying that everything that we have is a gift from God. Everything that we have. Right. Uh, including our salvation. Sure. So we don't boast uh, over the fact that we are saved because we realize that it's uh, 100% a gift from our God and Jesus Christ. Sure. What's your position on those who did not get the gift, the unregenerate? Well, that's... Are they just as much uh, faultless for not receiving as you are faultless for receiving? Uh, Faultless... I, I'm not sure if you can be so faultless be. for receiving. Well, well, I'm just well. Let's take the word faultless out. Uh, let's say responsible. Because it, it simply says that you're not responsible for the gift. So therefore, with those that do not receive the gift, according to your worldview, I'm just trying to figure this out. Would you say those that did not receive the gift are they res- are they just as irresponsible as you are for receiving it? Um. Well, I, I think I. You see where I'm going. With yeah. This, if right? I could, if I could put it this way. Uh, the fact that I received it and they didn't uh, doesn't make me any any superior. I think that's clear from sure. what Paul is saying. Um, am I? Did I do anything to receive it? No, I didn't. And so both of us deserve hell. Okay. Uh, God has been gracious to one of us and uh, given, uh, from my worldview, given me the uh, perspective on who Jesus Christ is and given me the ability to believe in him, trust in him. Sure. And so that which I have... Christianity is that which I received freely. And so I can't say that I'm any smarter than someone who doesn't believe in the gospel or I'm any, any, in any way superior, either by intellect or by class or by race right. or any other way. Right. Um, and so all, all men are created in God's image, believer and unbeliever. Right. And, and God is the gift giver. And for some reason, he, he chose to give me the gift. And I'm very grateful for that. Sure. And, and, and I respect that. I respect that position that you hold. I, I know you hold it dear, and you're you're passionate about it. And I um, I would never ridicule you for that, for having that contrast. What I'm trying to do basically is just try to squash a lot of this ridicule that I've been uh, associated with over the last, um, geez, probably three years of even when I was a believer trying to witness the gospel and uh, do my part as far as the the gospel call goes and. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you've noticed it with me, you know, and I, you and I, uh, have a lot of contact, um, and have had a lot of contact over the last year. Uh, I have lessened, um, my, uh, I guess you would say my agitation towards the believers for mm-hmm. having their position. Um, I more or less have grown into more of a, uh, Hey, let's sit and talk about this mm-hmm. instead of let's beat each other over the head with our books. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that you're starting to understand that, um, you know, it's not very profitable for people to sit there and try to shove each other into submission. And, you know, according to your worldview, it is the work of the gospel. It's the mm-hmm. work of the Spirit. And that is a, a working of God only. And, uh, yes, you are his, um, you know, his, his little phone call dialers. <laughs> you know, you guys set out the message, but... Ultimately, it's, it's his work, and I just wanted to remind the Christians out there that are listening to this that um, be very cautious of that when you're presenting the gospel, because it is the work of the gospel. It's not how funny or how sarcastic or how belittling you can be uh, for those who come to a different uh, understanding or a different conclusion uh, with this material. And I think that you're going to uh, get a hearty amen from me on that, Derek. <laughs> now we don't agree on very many things, but uh, I'm in 100 percent agreement with everything that you just said. Well, that's that's good. That, that I just you know wanted to call. I don't want to take up too much time. I know you got a lot of callers coming in, 
but I just wanted to kind of bring everybody back, you know what I mean? Just sure. anchor everybody back into what's really going on here instead of trying to, you know, you know, fight each other and, and, and make fun of each other and make names out of each other. So I can uh, appreciate you can take that. Your next caller. I'll, I'll let you go. I can appreciate that. All right, All right buddy. Take All care. Right, take care. All Bye. right, let's go to James calling from Louisville, Kentucky. James, welcome once again to The Narrow Mind. Uh, hey, Gene. How are you, my friend? I'm doing fine. Good, good. Now, for those that uh, may be listening for the first time or, or didn't catch some of our previous shows, I think this is about the third time that we've talked. You called in last Sunday night on the Atheist Hour. We had open phones, and uh, yep. you were um, you were bringing up some of those, what we would refer to as time texts, uh, and attempting to demonstrate that Jesus is a false prophet because he seemed to, seemed to indicate that something was about to happen, uh, namely he was about to come uh, again, within a generation of uh, the people that he stood talking to. Yep. And so we went through some of those passages. So what would you like to talk about tonight? Well, um, first I'd like to ask a couple, ask you a couple things about some uh, Calvinist, uh, uh, you know, issues with the doctrine. Okay. Okay. Um, when, when someone, you know, is elect, mm-hmm. at some point in their life, uh, don't they become aware, you know, that they... You know that they are a Christian or aware of God or aware aware of their election. Yeah, well, there that's called conversion. So, if somebody is elect, then at some particular junction in their life, they will uh, hear the gospel, believe, and trust in Christ. Okay. You know, um, if that's true, wouldn't that mean that you know, for the first, I don't know, maybe you know, a thousand or so years, there were no elect, you know, people in, say, you know, South America, Australia, you know, far off, you know, areas of the world where, you know, Christianity hadn't spread. I mean, yeah, would that yeah true? You're, you're absolutely right. In fact, in Romans chapter 11, uh, the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Rome says, how will they hear unless we send a preacher? And how will they believe uh, unless they are preached to? And so the message is very, very clear that uh, faith comes by hearing, and hearing through the Word of Christ. So, uh, so God decided, you know, for those first, you know, thousands and thousands of years of, you know, you know, Chinese history and, you know, Egyptian history and, you know, all these other people, not a single one of them was worthy of being saved till, till you know, till Jesus came about. Well, uh... Uh, not a single human being ever that's lived has been worthy of being uh, saved by Jesus Christ. I well, think. none were none were elect. Let me let me rephrase that. No, you know, millions, possibly billions of people, and not a single one was elected until two thousand years ago. Well, no, God has always had an elect people uh, from the beginning with Adam, and then we see Abraham, and we see you know we see uh, Noah. Yeah, in that one centralized area of the world. Yeah. But basically what you're saying is that, except for this this tribe right here in this, you know, certain region of the world, mm-hmm. you know, everybody else who, you know, who ever existed, not a single one of them was elect. If they didn't come into contact with the preaching of God's Word, then, James, you're absolutely 100% correct. Isn't that, I mean, you, you don't see any issue with that, that, you know? Yeah, you know what, I, I do see an issue with it. And here's the issue that I see with it. Um, the issue is that I can't figure out why God would uh, even deal with people like Noah and Abraham and Adam. Uh, that's well, the issue, he created that's, them that way anyways. I mean, he foreordained everything anyway. So. Yeah, that's, that's the issue that I have, that uh, God would even save one sinner. Well, he's only dealing with his own creations anyways, isn't he? Absolutely. So, I mean, he knew what he was doing when he created, you know, created these people in the first place. So it's not like he's like dealing with their stubbornness because he knew when he created them since the beginning of time exactly how stubborn they was going to be. Correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But that doesn't negate the fact that they exercised uh, their own volition and, uh, and, and demonstrated a stubborn attitude toward, uh, toward God himself. Well, I won't even get into the whole tulip thing again. We went through that the first call. But, um, uh, another issue about Calvinism, you know, it it seems like a pretty depressing worldview in that, you know, nothing you can do could ever, you know, earn you salvation unless God picks you. 
And, you know, I don't mean to be offensive with, with uh, you know, with this question. I'm just, you know, trying to get your view about this. Okay, um, your son, you know, you know, he's, he's a, in, in your opinion, what do you say? You know, he's a he's a good kid and everything. You know, you love your son, yeah, right? Yeah, of course I love my son. Okay, um, now there's the possibility that, you know, while you, you know, you believe that you're elect, he will not be elect. Is that correct? Uh, that's a very real possibility. Uh, but concerning my son, if we're going to use a, a real life analogy, he has expressed faith in Jesus Christ and has been baptized. And, and I, I, I do see uh, indications in his life that he is uh, born again, that he is regenerated, and he is uh, a believer in Jesus Christ. Well, you know, I mean, I'm, I apologize because I'm not trying to. No, you that's know. okay. Well, you know what, James? I, I have another son. <laughs> Maybe we should talk about him. I have another son that's 20 years old. And uh, I don't see those things in his life. So there is a possibility that if, if he doesn't repent, if he doesn't bear fruit worthy of uh, what he claims to be, then he could be lost, yes. Um, do you believe that you retain any knowledge of your life experiences when you go to heaven? I think we're going to retain all of it. Okay, well, we are told, you know, I believe by Paul, and I believe it also says in, I believe it says in Revelation that, you know, there will be no sadness. You know, every uh, tear shall be wiped and dry. Mm-hmm. So, you know, on the one hand, you have, you know, your, you know, your child, your flesh and blood, you know, your, your beloved, you know, son, you know, who's going to, you know, be tossed into a furnace, a furnace, you know, burning and, you know, being in eternal torment, you know, you know, forever. Mm-hmm. And yet up you're in heaven, you're going to know this and you're, you're, you're going to be happy about it because you're not going to be sad. There's no sadness in heaven. You can't cry about it or nothing. So how do you balance that? I mean, do you just say, you know, I don't care? No, I do care. But uh, the way that I balance that is that in this life right now, I continue to pray for my son. I continue to ask that God would be merciful to him. But if that reality does take place, we have to remember that God is the one who gave me the gift of that son. Who is greater, the one who gave the gift or the gift itself? If the one who gave the gift who does nothing wrong, who is 100% holy and righteous in all that he does. All of his judgments are true and loving and, and, and in accord with his own word. Uh, I guarantee that I won't find fault with him, and I will rejoice in the presence of his, uh, in, in his very presence for all eternity, and in, on top of that, uh, rejoice in his righteousness, even in his judgments. So you will be happy that your son's burning, basically, then. Because, I mean, God God decided, you know, not to elect him. So you're going to be happy with God's choices because, you know, that's his... I will, I will be satisfied with God's choices, yes. Happy. Oh. I, I will be delighted with God's choices. And I, and I will tell my son right now, as I do on a regular basis, son, uh, there is a day of judgment coming. And uh, those who are not found in Christ will be judged according to their own sins. And I can guarantee you that no man will stand on that day. But you said that, you know, your, your, your son, Noah, he, he exhibits, you know, what you believe is, you know, the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit, that's right. Yeah, and everything. But you still can't be sure because there's people like, you know, Dan Barker and George Templeton who seem to have exhibited that same thing and yet, you know, fell away. So, I mean... Well, even, me even, even to talking to those guys, I mean... Dan Barker didn't even have a clear understanding of the gospel. I mean, he was using extra biblical language to, uh, to to try to explain to me what the gospel is. So, I think it's I think it's important for us to uh, to to have an accurate understanding of the truth when we, in fact, call ourselves Christian and and, and claim to embrace the gospel. So, it, not only that, but the, the, the very denomination that, that Dan Barker belonged to, the Assemblies of God, it doesn't, it, it doesn't rank very high on my list of uh, denominations that accurately present and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, it doesn't even have to be Dan Barker. I mean, because, you know, there's Christians of, you know, all kinds of denominations who, you know, sooner or later, you know, you know some t- at some point in their life, you know, fall away. So it doesn't have to be him, you know, but... Um, it, that just seems like a, you know, you know, disturbing to me that, you know, your own flesh and blood, you know, this child that you've given life to, you know, the, you know, and them being tortured for all eternity 
doesn't really matter because God just didn't like them. Well, I hope, no, that's not why. If they are tortured for all eternity, uh, then it's not just because God didn't like them. It's because they violated God's law. Well, everybody violates God's they, law according to yeah, you know Christian yeah. doctrine. And so. they persisted in that violation in the face of a, a genuine offer of, of escape and salvation. Uh, Even they Christ, they do, thumbed their nose at God. Don't Christians still continue to sin? Yes, even do. after you've been, you know, you know, don't you, uh, you know, every once in a while slip up and do something against yeah, God's law? Absolutely. Well, what's the difference? Other than God just said, "Hey, I'm not going to elect you." The difference is Christ died for my sins. That's the difference. Well, it's the same thing. He died for your sins, not, not you know, your 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 son's sins or you know whoever. Well, see, he he adopted me. He it's not as if it's just a a contractual agreement where he just crosses my name off the list. He he brought me into a a, a relationship with him that is uh, synonymous with a relationship between a husband and a wife. That's why the church is called the Bride of Christ, and so I have this loving relationship with him, in which I uh, have come to know him and and continue to come to know him through the study of his word. And in doing so, uh, I'm bringing him glory, or at least I, I, my goal is to bring him glory in everything that I say and do in this life. And so I am, I am adoring him with my life. I'm, I'm living with him. You know, something even more sad than to me, you said it, it, it seems pretty sad that you could have a son and, you know, because he's not elect, you, you loved him and everything, and then he gets punished for his sins for all eternity. Well, let me tell you something even more sad, something even more sad is that really there's no difference between my son and my dog when it comes to death. That my, when my dog died because he choked on a bone, I really have no reason to be any more you know, in grief than I, I, I did when my, when my son dies. Because ultimately they're just... How could you just, even say that? <laughs> well, from an atheistic worldview, it, it's, it's just matter in motion. It's just biological bags. There is no meaning of life. We're just, you know, we're just time and chance mixed together in a bag that holds us together. Until life itself is the meaning. Doing, you know, living a fulfilling life is its meaning. Not, you know, see, we don't live this life in preparation of another life that we're not even sure is there. That's why we take advantage of this life. So to say that life has no meaning, you know, is, is simply not true. Well, my my worldview says that life does have meaning. But if we are nothing more than an advanced form of the animal kingdom, then really there's no difference between you, me, and the In-N-Out burger that I had for lunch. No, we have life experiences, emotions, a cow love, has and life stuff ex- like that. A, a cow has life experiences, too. In Does fact, it have love? You know, you know, you know, there's so many things, you know, to human life. I mean, you know, to say that we're just, you know, molecules, emotions, it, it, it's more than that. You're right, it is more than that, because, James, you are made in the image of God. And the fact that you have experienced things like love are an indication that there is more to you than just a a biological aspect. You are made in God's image. Okay, Animals don't don't experience love, you're right. But you're not an animal. You are a human being who's been made in God's image. If these things, you know, are more than, you know, biological matter... Why is it that, you know, the brain, if we, can suffer, if we suffer, you know, brain injuries, it can have effects, you know, on our brains as far as, you know, you know, our personality, our memory, the way we act and stuff. If the soul is, you know, you know an entity within ourselves or whatever that, you know, gives us the, these emotions and everything, then how can it be affected by damage to the physical body? Because in this life, the expression of the soul is, associ- is contingent upon... Uh, the physical life, the physical body that God has given us. That's why in redemption, God redeems the whole man. God is not just concerned about the soul, but when the resurrection happens, he will redeem both body and soul. And so, yeah, you can you can suffer a brain injury. Does that mean that you've suffered a soul injury? No, it just means that your, your ability to express uh, who you are as a uh, immaterial being through your material personhood has been somewhat diminished. I would disagree. I would say that that is proof that who we are, our emotions and everything, is nothing but the, you know, the physical body. That's, that's how I would personally view it. So when you, if you get your arm chopped off, are you any less human being than you were when you had, you know, two arms? 
No, but the arm doesn't control, you know, your your thoughts and your emotions and everything like that. Okay, well, it's part of your physical body. If if what if, are you talking about? That if, we're, t- we're talking about the brain, not the I mean, a pinky toe or anything like that. Okay, well, I'm going to have to disagree with you. I'm going to tell you that we are more than just physical bodies, and if we're not, then you, once again, you've just made the case that there is no difference between us and our dog on the day of death. The, the feelings of love and the emotions that you have for other human beings uh, are, are a, a, direct, uh, a direct response or a direct aspect of what it means to be made in the image of God. What evidence do you have for the soul that one exists, that uh, we all have souls? Well, uh, God's Word. Well, you've got a book. But what, what tangible evidence as far as... You know, a book is tangible um, evidence, isn't it? If God gives it, if God decides to teach me that I'm made up of soul and body, that's, there's ten, sorry, that's tangible, tangible evidence, isn't it? It's a book. Yeah, I, I could write anything on a book. Does that make it? Does that make it true? No, I'm it talking doesn't. about testable, you know, physiological evidence that there is a soul. But if this book it demonstrates itself to be more than just a man-made book, then we do have reason to believe that it's true. And but it so, has not done so. Well, it has done so because it's a precondition for life. God's Word is a precondition for even this conversation where we're going back and, and forth making point and counterpoint. Because in a, bio- in a strictly naturalistic universe, there is no such thing as intelligent conversation. It's just brain farts. And, you know, can you prove this? I mean, I can show that your God is completely illogical. You, you, uh, in our previous phone call, you said that God is omniscient and op- omnipotent, correct? All-powerful, all-knowing, correct. Okay, so you go redefine the terms. Well, for our listening you, you audience... You did say omniscient, omniscient and op- omnipotent yeah, that's what in those our previous terms phone call. That's what those terms mean, don't they? Well... You know, if you go try and go like a Elvin Plantinga route, you'll say maximally powerful or something like that. But if you're omniscient and you know all things, how can you make a choice if you know all things already? If you're omniscient and you know all things, how can you make a choice? Yeah, because you would already know all your actions ahead of time. You wouldn't, you know, God could not have any type of will if he already knew all of his actions already ahead of time. And therefore, if he can't make a choice, then he's not omnipotent because, you know, that's something he can't do. Unless therefore, he's... those two attributes will make him incoherent. Well, I disagree with you. Uh, it, because uh, you're confusing making a choice with knowing the future. And the two are not in conflict at all. If you know the future, you cannot make a choice. Because to make a you, choice would be change that what if be knowing, changing the future. What if knowing the fu- What if in knowing the future you knew that you made a choice? How is there a contradiction there? How are you going to make a choice if you already knew that the cho- the choice you were going to make originally? And this is where theologians have regarded the decrees of God as being eternal. The decrees of God, all the plans that God has, are eternal. Then now, when did you, when did you he make a, the plan? You have finite. You, they're eternal. They've always been, they always will be. So you, as a finite man, cannot comprehend the infinite God. That's an appeal to ignorance right there. Well, yes, it is. And compared to God, we're all ignorant. If you say he has, he's had his plans for all eternity, how can he ever make an action when he's already planned it? Because his actions are part of his plan. But then... He cannot, you know, the action is already predefined. So? If it's, if it's predefined in his plan, he cannot make a choice. <laughs> what if he predefines his choice? That, that's your argument against God being omniscient? That's just an a argument for uh, incoherence. Well, once again, there is no such thing as incoherence in an atheistic worldview. The mind is just uh, a physical... A physical re- reality that uh, fires off neurons from time to time. So what? I mean, y- you talking to me right now is no different than two trees rubbing up against each other in the wind. You know, you're 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 seven up. I'm Coca Cola. You fizz one way, I fizz the other way. 
Big deal. You see, in a naturalistic worldview or in a materialistic worldview, this, this is just meaningless. But in a worldview that is governed by God, where men's souls and the expressions of their hearts have eternal consequences, dialogue like this is very important. Well, if your God exists and the things in the Bible are true, uh, then things such as objective morality, you know, logic, science, you know, those things, you know, cannot exist. I mean, I know you, you know all about t- uh, TAG, and I'm sure you've read about TANG, too, correctly? Yeah, I, I've read TANG. I, it, basically, TANG is, uh, is a misunderstanding of what TAG is. Anybody who critiques, any critique I've seen up to this point that tries to critique TAG, which is a transcendental argument for the existence of God, they just don't understand the argument. And what is that argument? That, uh, that the existence of logic, you know, morality, science, and everything presupposes the existence of God, correct? That's right. That, that um, God is a precondition for science, morality, and logic. And yet his, his miracles in the Bible, they violate science. Many they, they violate, violate logic. They violate the natural laws of this universe, yeah. Well, okay, that's, if there's no uniform laws of science or logic, then how can they presuppose God? Well, there are uniform laws, but God is the one who set them down. Now, if there's no uniform laws, how can you say, how can you even have a word like miracle, which violates, which is a violation of those uniform laws? Well, you just explained it right there. I mean, how can, mir- if, if, uh, mor- if uh, logic and science, you know, exist, and they presuppose, you know, God. I mean, how can he do a miracle which violates those very things? Because the laws of <laughs> the laws of nature are subject to God, and he can act above and beyond them any time he wishes to do so. So then they're not concrete. Like morality. Uh, morality is ta- attached to God's whim. You know, whatever he wants, you know, he can make rape, you know, not, not immoral. Not, not, if he, not if he commands otherwise. If God in some place commands that rape is immoral, then God cannot make rape moral. So God is not omnipotent then? No, God will not work against his own nature. And so... He, he changes his mind all the time. In Genesis 6, after he uh, created man, it, it says he uh, repented him that, you know, he man made, he created man on the earth and he, he wished to destroy everybody. James, I, I am really impressed by your knowledge of Scripture. Uh... Do you know what an anthropomorphism is? An anthropomorphism is a linguistic device that is commonly used in the Scripture where God identifies himself with the attributes of man in order to communicate a certain truth to man. And so what God is expressing is not that he changed his mind as a man changes his mind. The Scripture is clear that that doesn't happen. What God is expressing is is it's kind of like baby language. God is talking baby language to those who are infants compared to his, uh, his vast knowledge and omniscience. And so he must condescend to our level to speak to us in a way in which we can understand things. I would disagree because if we see, you know, God all throughout the Old Testament, basically mankind has created this God and attached human attributes to him. You know, everything from the eyes, the backside, the feet, and everything like that. Now, you might say that, you know, he's doing the baby talk like you just said, but basically all he is is, you know, a concept where they just made, you know, a man. Yeah, and what proof do you have for that, James? For for somebody who places a high value on proof, I'd like to know, what proof do you have for that? It's all throughout the Bible. You just made an assertion that, that, um, you just made an assertion. The earth earth is the the footstool of God, Uh, I believe it was in... uh, no, what, what, what evidence do you have that the Bible is a man-made product and it's not the divine revelation of God? Well, there's the historical inaccuracies, failed prophecies, the fact that we can see how the stories, you know, okay. originated in other cultures, and there is, you know, we can see, you know, What's you a, know, from the uh, epic of prophecy? Gilgamesh and stuff like that, can you, you know, me? how the stories came about. Can you give me? Oh, you can. So you're gonna you're gonna trust history, uh, which is the product of man. You weren't there to see it. Some man wrote it down, and you're gonna Just like the but, Bible. And yet you're gonna say that the Bible's not valid because it was written down by man. 
And so it seems to me that you're being quite arbitrary in that which you're deciding to believe and that which you're deciding to reject. Well, if we compare the Bible to other works found in other cultures, we can see trends. We can see how things evolve over time. Well, we would actually, I would use that same evidence, such as the episode of Gilgamesh, to prove or to demonstrate that uh, there was a worldwide flood. And it was handed down through the people of God by the Word of God, and it was handed down through those that were outside or those that uh, departed into other regions um, through, the, through vocal transmission. The only problem is that some of them predate, you know, the dating of the Bible. You can't predate it. You can't yes, predate it. Yeah, you can't. Yeah, can't. We got Chinese history that goes back past six thousand years. Oh, really? And, yeah. and, and 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 you and you when when it says that when the Chinese write down that they've been around for six thousand years, you just automatically believe that, right? You don't even have to just look at the Chinese. You, you, you just believe you that. Look at, you look at James, Egypt, James. We you, can we can use carbon dating and all types of different things. To, James, you, know. you, you arbitrarily believe that Chinese history goes back six thousand years. You arbitrarily. Leave, arbitrarily believe that everything in the Bible is automatically correct and everybody else is wrong. Okay, but hold on a second. What I believe is what I believe is what I believe, but you call me up and you demand certain evidences and then you you don't require those evidences for the very things that you believe. You see the difference between my worldview and your worldview is that I I do believe the Bible is the word of God. So if you want to call that arbitrary, that's fine. But I also have good reasons for believing that the Bible is the Word of God, such as fulfilled prophecies, such as historical reasons, such as the transformation that's been wrought in my own life at age 26 from a wicked sinner, from a drug addict, to to somebody who has just been brought 180 degrees to, to be in love with Jesus Christ and have a care for people which I had no concern for whatsoever. Well, here's the thing, though. People of other faiths claim the same thing. Well, that's why they, I listed that second. That's why I went to the Word of God first, and I, I base my, my foundations for belief on the Word of God itself. My experience is secondary, but yet it's not irrelevant. Because if I can demonstrate that the Bible is true, then my experience is true also. Well, what about the Muslim who says that they can prove that through using their prophecies and everything in their book, that it's true. Well, we can, they sit, can, we can they, sit, uh, claim to have some type of revelations in their lives. Yeah, well, guess what? It comes down to faith. They claim to have the Old Testament as the foundation for the Quran. So all we have to do is sit down and compare. Is this a true claim? Is the Quran consistent with the Old Testament? If the answer is no, then we do the same thing we do with the Mormons. The Mormons claim that they have another revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, what do we do with that? I mean... Well, there's non-Abrahamic religions as well, too. Well, uh, there are all kinds of religions, and you know why? Because man is religious by nature. Man was created to you just worship... Told me the other, sorry, you told me on my last phone call that all people are born atheists. Is that not correct? All people are born atheists in respect to the true God. Oh, okay. But yet all men worship something. All men worship something. What it boils down to is all you have is faith. You can't prove Christianity any more than the Muslim can prove Islam or, or the Hindu can prove you know, Hinduism or anything. Well, I think I can. I think I can demonstrate that if you take God out of the equation, that there is no foundation or basis for things like logic. And so for an atheist to ask me to prove something is really ridiculous. Why do you, you always come back to to tag? Well, you're the one that keeps bringing up proof, 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 proof. And what, it's, it's, you have no proof, so you're like, okay, well, wait you a keep minute. coming back to tag. It's like, where, oh, well, you, you, there's no such thing as proof. It's you a know. precondition. That's why I said the Bible is a precondition for logic, morality, and science. You ask me to prove something, which means you want me to use the laws of reason, the laws of logic, and demonstrate uh, some truth claim that I'm making. But I'm simply asking you, in a naturalistic worldview, where we're all biological bags in motion, to quote, quote the late Dr. Greg Bonson, where does logic come from? And if we are just the product of evolution, then 
logic is evolving also, and your logic may not be the same as mine. In fact, there's a good chance that it's totally different. So for you to ask me or for you to impose the framework or the wiring of your mind on my mind is, is quite ridiculous. The very concept of your God goes against logic and reason. How? And even morality. How? Like I said, he... <laughs> God in himself. Yeah, but you, know. you have no... See, I can tell you where my logic, morality, and, and the uniformity of nature comes from. It comes from the God of the Bible. But James, wh- where does logic come from? Where, it's developed, it's uh, built upon observations by human beings. It's built upon observations. So the law of gravity, that's built upon observations, Right. So the law of gravity just exists because it's something that man observes? Like I said before, it's Or did not, it exist? Did, it's not something written into the, you know, the fabric of the cosmos. Did logic It's something exist? that we use, like time, to, you know, you know, mark observations, to, you know, we see patterns and things like that. So we use logic, you know, to, to understand things. Well, I'm going to agree with you there, but you haven't given me a source... I mean, where does it come from? Where did it come from? It isn't an actual thing, like like a book that you can grab. It's it's like writing. It's it's like language. So it's immaterial. We develop language to to be able to you know exchange ideas, to convey ideas, and you know you know convey patterns and things that we can observe. So logic then for you is is immaterial. It's not something like a book that you can grab. No, it's not like a book that you can grab. Is it immaterial? Just like your thoughts, what you're thinking in your head. In your head. It's not, you know... Well, guess what? When you say that our, my thoughts are not material, you've just uh, undermined no. your materialistic worldview. Because uh, you've just acknowledged... You can grab. You just acknowledge that there's something going on here that's not material. And so you're on your way to accepting theism, whether you realize it or not. You know, I, uh, James, no, I think James, you're, you're I, way I, I've, enjoyed, I've enjoyed the conversation with you. I've given you a lot of time. I've got uh, some other callers that have been waiting patiently, and uh, in, in all fairness, I need to get to them. But I always enjoy talking to you, and you're welcome to call back here anytime. Okay. Uh, right. Talk to you later. Thank you. All right. Let's go to our next call. Let's go to Arthur calling from Mid-Cities. Arthur, welcome to The Narrow Mind. Hey, Pastor Cook. Thank Where you for you, your patience. Where was from? Uh, I said <laughs> mid cities. What? I'm, I'm going by memory now. So okay, I'm in the Mountain View area. Mountain California. View, California. I'm sorry. Or Santa Clara County. Whichever Santa Clara way you County. Want it. I, I did get your. I, I want to tell you, thank you for the heads up. Our server was down for the last 24 hours. Oh really? Yeah, and and you're the first one that brought it to my attention because I was away from my computer yesterday. But uh, I would like to say that it was a a diabolic scheme to overthrow the ministry of. Unchained radio, but it was just a, a hard drive that froze up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, Satan! He went, yeah, he went I, to your hard drive. I did. I did get your. I did get your book also, <laughs> and I have it sitting on my desk. And I, I was. I was impressed just by looking at it. I mean, it. It looks like it's. Um, you know, first of all, it's a good size. It's a hardback, so I'm looking forward to reading it. Okay. Uh, and I want to thank you for sending me that. Oh, no problem. I mean, you're doing ministry in that area, and so am I. So it makes sense that we uh, we uh, tag team. <laughs> there you go. Don't say tag. People get upset around here. <laughs> so what's oh, going man. on? Yeah, so what is tag, by the way? I'm not familiar with that uh, acronym. Ta- tag is, uh, it, it stands for the Transcendental Argument for the Existence of God. Oh, okay. And uh, what I it is, it, it sh- it's basically an argument that uh, tries to demonstrate it's a it, it it falls in line with the presuppositional approach, so automatically it's going to hold the um, it's going to hold the uh, the Bible as an authority, and then it's going to demonstrate that the existence of God is a precondition for all of life, and so f- for example, for somebody to say, hey, I want you to prove that the Bible is true, what Tag does is it demonstrates that in order to have something even known as proofs. Um, God must be existing because he's the one that gave us the ability to reason and to arrive at proofs or to arrive at truth based on evidence. And so what it does is it kind of takes the whole argument back one step previous and, and, and begins with God. 
Oh, okay. And it's very okay. effective. I, I, I think I've heard it heard it before. Not, I haven't even looked into it in detail, but I, I've heard of it. Yeah, Van Til, uh, Cornelius Van Til is is one of the guys that really popularized it in our day. Um, okay. There's a book called, it's by Greg Bonson, it's called Van Til's Reading and Analysis, uh, where he kind of documents all this. But Van Til was very philosophical in his writing, and so if you don't have a philosophical background, it's kind of hard to, to understand. Uh, so Greg Bonson kind of breaks it down a little bit and uh, does a good job. Okay, great. Um, great call. I, I, I really like the uh, patience and the dialogue you just had with, I think his name was James? Yeah, James. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I enjoy I, talking to that guy. He's, yeah, he's I, I smart. enjoyed the dialogue. He's a smart guy. I mean, he knows he knows the Bible too. Um, you know, obviously we arrive at different conclusions, but I'm always interested in talking to uh, to people like that. Right, right. <clears throat> I wanted um, to talk about uh, the you know the uh, the trial that's going on right now about uh, intelligent design. Mm-hmm. Have you heard about that? No, I haven't. There's a trial yeah. going on. Was it, it, it? Does it have to do with uh, should intelligent design be taught in school or something? Yeah, it's, some, it's something like that. But it, it's really, you know, I, I think people have like blown, blown it out of proportion because what it, what's happening is there's a, a courtroom uh, drama going on in, in Dover, I think it's Pennsylvania, mm-hmm. and uh, they're asking a jury to decide whether or not a school board should um, allow teachers. To, to basically read a disclaimer on evolution uh, that offers intelligent design as, as an alternative. Hmm. And it's just basically a blurb, you know, that that gives you an alternative. Right. And they, they're going into, you know, a uh, big fuss over that, and I guess some atheists uh, and some other people who dislike the idea of, of intelligent design for whatever reason have filed a suit over a blurb. <laughs> hmm that a school board decided, you know, that they wanted to, to allow into the scientific uh, arena. And so that's basically what's going on. I've been reading different articles on, uh, uh, on the web about the, uh, the whole issue. Mm-hmm. And what strikes me as strange, or not so much strange, but it's just interesting how it's been twisted, because uh, I've read a lot about intelligent design. And there's all kinds of theories about creation and creationism. There's biblical creationism creationism, there's scientific creationism, there's intelligent design. Mm-hmm. And they're not all exactly the same. But what the media is doing is distorting it so that people think that, you know, they're just talking about the Bible. Do you want to put the Bible into right. school? That kind of thing. Which really, it isn't the case. Intelligent design is just based on the principle that you can look, you know, go outside and look at a car and, and, and examine it scientifically and, and, reason, and use reason to determine that that had that it has design principles involved in it, mm-hmm. you know. And, so, and, and but so, it, but it, I think uh, it automatically uh, assumes that there's a designer, right? But it, what you're saying is it doesn't automatically associate itself with Christianity. No, it doesn't. Not not necessarily, or even the Bible. Right. Okay. Yeah, because intelligent design just simply says that. Um, for example, in the biological world. You know, we look at genetics and DNA that, you know, it's, it's very complicated and complex, and those kinds of things don't come about just by chance processes, mm-hmm. chance natural processes. You, know, you don't drop your soup and then, you know, the letters, uh, alphabet soup, and the letters come out, uh, how are you doing today? You know, it doesn't work <laughs> like that. It takes intelligent design to produce right. you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Or intelligence to produce that kind of thing. Um, I want to read you a quote. Okay. Okay, from it's actually from my book, <laughs> but I'm quoting someone else, and it says, quote, Animals give the appearance of having been designed by theoretically sophisticated and practically ingenious physicists or engineer, close quote. Now, can you guess who said that? Read it to me one more time, please. Oh, okay. Animals give the appearance of having been designed by theoretically sophisticated and practically ingenious physicists or engineer. That sounds like something that maybe Charles Darwin would say. Hmm. <laughs> Am I, I right? Just, I would just say Charles Darwin. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I think I remember reading that uh, somewhere. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, but I, 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 couldn't, I can't be sure, so maybe okay. you can tell me who it was. Well, you're close in a way. It was actually an evolutionist who said that, and an atheist. <laughs> um, wow. 
you know, so this is one of the things I, I, I find strangely ironic that the, the, the people that are against the theory of design can look at the world and see design. Mm -hmm. They'll say apparent design, you know, they'll call it, it only looks like it's design, but, you know, <laughs> sometimes things look like what they really are, you know. Yeah, yeah, there and, definitely seems to be uh, an order to the universe. Right, right, and, and when you have all these, you know, scientists, and I, I've put a collection of them in my book of, of scientists who aren't believers, who mm -hmm. are saying, you know, who are seeing design in the universe just like believers are, it, it, what that says is that we're looking at objective reality, not something that's just subjective to just the believers. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I wish atheists would take a, 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 a more concentrated look at, because you can't get away from that, <laughs> you know? No, it's I, subjective. Yeah. If it's subjective, then it's just us believers who are seeing it. But yeah. when unbelievers can see the same thing, it's no longer subjective. Right. See, it sounds like it, uh, Romans chapter 1 in, in action there. Definitely, and Psalm 19. And there's your evidence for James. That's a part of the evidence. I mean, there's tons of evidence out there. Mm -hmm. It's just that I think a lot of times people don't uh, investigate the evidence uh, in a, in a you know, thorough manner. Well, one of the problems with investigating evidence is that we all come to the table of evidence with our uh, with our preconceived bias, and so two people can look, and we see this all the time in these trials, you know, these murder trials. Yeah. Two, two people can look at the same evidence and arrive at different conclusions based on their bias. Now, that's not to say that their bias cannot be overturned, right. but I, I I don't think that there is such a thing as neutrality especially when it comes to the subject of God. Uh, we, we, we come to the evidence either as believers or unbelievers, and so we tend to interpret the evidence in light of our worldview, uh, the worldview that we begin with. Right, right. And uh, one of the reasons why I, I have this um, affinity, if you will, for atheists and atheism is because um, as I thought about it, I'd probably be an atheist if I wasn't a Christian because I grew up loving science. I grew up, you know, getting awards in science in school. Mm. So, you know, I'm no stranger to science and reason and logic. I mean, I, I have no problem with those things because I believe God is the ultimate author of uh, accurate knowledge of logic and reason. And it I just agree. Makes, you know, it just makes sense that, you know, the world has a certain order to it. It works a certain way. Sure, we have, you know, your, what you would call your problems in the world, your disasters and things like that. Mm -hmm. You have your genetic defects, but, you know, it's just like anything, it, um, as far as design principles, for example. Well, those can also be explained from a Christian worldview as right. uh, some of the results of, of, a, of a world that has fallen. Right. Is under the curse of God because of sin. And we read about this in Romans chapter 8, especially, that even the creation is groaning with great expectation for the time in which God will uh, redeem the creation itself, along with mankind. Right, exactly. And um, one of the things that I've looked at is, is when one of the arguments people try to use against uh, God and the designer concept is they'll take a defect, like, uh, say, cancer, a genetic defect, mm -hmm. or, or something like that, and they'll say, aha, you know, is that design? Well, actually, it's, it's a distortion of design. You mm -hmm. know, it's like going out to your car and there's a big dent in it. Right. Uh, the dent doesn't prove that the car wasn't designed. It actually is proof that it was designed because you, you actually have a defect in the design. Right, so and, and not only that, but you have to have, if you're going to look at a stick and say that it's crooked, you have to have <laughs> a straight stick in order to, uh, to measure it by. Make a judgment, right. To, right, yeah. to, to, make, uh, to, to, to have as an objective standard. You know, and it's always interesting to me. Now, I don't know if you've ever pondered this before, but I'll just throw this out because... Um, uh, it's an interesting observation, I think. In the homosexual community, a non-homosexual is someone who is referred to as straight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that means, and I've asked him this, so when you call me straight, does that mean that you are less than straight or you are some way in some way crooked? <laughs> and they well, kind of get this the smile. Like, uh, they just smile. You know, I used to, <laughs> a, a few years back, I used to go down to the... Um, to the gay pride parade in San Diego and uh, kind of mix and mingle down there and, and, and talk to people. And I uh, had some interesting conversations down there, very interesting conversations. Uh, in fact, I had one guy that tried to get me kicked out of there 
uh, because all the protesters are supposed to be in a particular area. And I wasn't in that area, but I said I wasn't protesting. I'm not protesting homosexuality. I'm simply uh, telling people about Jesus Christ. So that the the policeman said, well, he's not protesting. So right. he's okay. Arthur, yeah. I, I, I enjoy talking to you once again. I do have to move to uh, our last call of the evening. Okay, no problem. All right, I keep in touch, brother. The, the conversation. God okay. bless you. All right, let's go to Dan uh, Dan Barrett calling from Moore, Oklahoma. Dan, welcome to The Narrow Mind. Hi, how are you? I'm doing great, thank you. Yeah, I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, Calvinism. Uh-huh. Is it, uh, so is the position that... Uh, that um, that people are paid are responsible for for sins that Adam committed. Well, um, Reformed theology, more specifically, it basically teaches, and I would, and I'm I'm going to hold the position that the Bible teaches this also. That um, in Adam, well, let me just read 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 the scripture to you, uh, so that there's no mistake here. Uh, so that we don't confuse this with the ideas of man versus uh, the Word of God. In Romans 5.18, it says, So then, as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. And so we have what we call uh, federal headship, where Adam becomes a representative of the human race. And while Adam is there in the garden with his wife, when Adam rebels... He becomes a representative, a real representative for the human race, and the whole human race is condemned with Adam. Now, when Christ comes, Christ is referred to as the second Adam. And so Christ stands as a real representative before the Father. We call him a mediator. He stands as a mediator before the Father, and he represents those that are born in him. We're all born into Adam naturally. Those of us that are saved are born again or born in Christ through faith. And so... Adam has his physical offspring, Christ has his spiritual offspring, and we will either be judged as natural men paying for our own sins, or we will be judged in Christ, and Christ has already been judged in our place. But it, but it sounds like we're having to pay for for just what we were created as, not as not for what we did. Well, we have two problems. We have two well, but what, address the first problem. Though. Well, the first problem is is very real. Yeah, I am condemned. Because, how can that be, though? Well, let me let me tell you the flip side of the beauty of this. The flip side is also that I received Christ's righteousness, not based on what I did. Yeah, but you're not answering the question. But what he did. Well, that's the way God set it up. But you're not answering the question. What's the question? The question is, how can we be blamed for for how we were created? It's called federal headship. But that doesn't answer the question. Well, it's 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 called. That's the way God decided to do it. Well, that's that anybody can say that. Well, that's that's true, but that's the answer to the question given in Scripture. You may not well, like okay, it. Okay, if that's your answer, but I don't. That's think my that. answer. That's okay. the, that's the answer that I just read to you from Romans five eighteen. Okay. Are you a Christian? No, no. Well, once again, the good news is just as Adam represented you and and brought condemnation, so Christ can represent you before the Father also. If you have faith in well, Christ. Well, I mean, I, I mean, if you can't answer, you know, just basic questions like that. I, I did mean, answer. I read the scripture to you. I gave what, you God's answer. What? What is well, it that you, you don't you're, understand? You're talking to a non-believer. What does that mean? That doesn't mean much. What does it that you? What, what is it that you don't understand about my answer to the question? Well, I just explained it. You said, said well, "Why is it? Why is that the a, case? How can a person be blamed for the way God created him?" Uh, well, God created you also with a volition. And but you're, now you're adding to it. Well, I said that there were two problems. Well, you keep adding the second one, but you're never answering the first part. No, I did answer the first part. You didn't. I said that Adam is a real representative before the Father. Well, that doesn't answer the question. And what was the question? How can God do that? How can we be blamed for the way God created us? Because God created you with a, with a representative. That's how. That doesn't answer it. Well, I'll let our listening audience be the judge. I think it does answer the question. Well, okay, we'll let them answer it. And the second problem is that you not only have been represented by Adam and therefore are condemned in Adam, you have also demonstrated your, yourself to be a child of Adam in rebelling against God and continuing to break his law, even in light of God's goodness towards you. 
And so, but I think this, you know, I think it demonstrates the basic bankruptcy of of Calvinistic way of thinking. Well, non-Calvinists believe that also. Huh? That this isn't something that is just uh, this isn't just something that is restricted to Calvinist believers. Uh, well, biblical. I, think... I just read Romans five eighteen. So whether you're a Calvinist or an Arminian or a Calminian, uh, you still have to you still have to reckon with Romans five eighteen. It's not it's not a it's not a uh, it's not a, a man made doctrine. It's something that's derived from Scripture, and so it it doesn't have anything to do per se with Calvinism. It has to do with the Scripture. Having said that, uh, you know, like I said, well, I think, but I think that uh, non Calvinistic type Christians at least say that uh, you know you have the age of accountability and so forth. But so to where so so a person is is actually blamed for what he does rather than how he was created. Well, if somebody wants to give the age of accountability answer, then that's fine, but that's not derived from Scripture. As a Christian, well, you the know, scripture, the, as a Christian, the scripture is my standard. And so, Dan, when you call me up and you ask me a question, I don't give you my opinions. I take you to the Word of God. There's well, no, there's no age of accountability in Scripture. You're just not going to find it. Well, I, I was just, I was just, point, yeah, I was just pointing out. Uh, you were saying that all Christians believe that, and, and well, all and, Christians believe Romans five eighteen. Well, I was just pointing out that I, I think some denominations, at least, will say that uh, that I mean they do believe in things like age of accountability, to where a person actually has to make a choice before he can be condemned. Well, I guess um, they don't believe the Word of God, then, do they? Well, I guess not. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you can be a Christian and not believe the Word of God, but um, you know. Uh, that's between God and them. So, Dan, we are out of time. Okay. In fact, we've gone a few minutes over. I okay. Thank you for your call. All right. I want to remind all of our listeners once again to uh, to check out our homepage. You'll see there on the right hand column something called the Frapper Map. Click on that. Put your name in there and also uh, give us your zip code, and you'll be located there on the map. We can get an idea of who you are and where you're listening from. And, you know, I just want to reiterate before I sign off here. I don't like the idea of being condemned by Adam. In fact, uh, everything within me wants to revolt against that. Everything in my being wants to say that's not fair. But here's the clincher. The good news of the gospel is that grace isn't fair. Grace is unmerited favor. Grace is God's goodness toward those who don't deserve it. And so just as Adam represented me in the garden, and I was condemned in Adam, so Christ now represents me before the Father. And as a result, I will have life. As a result, as a result, I now have life in Jesus Christ. My name is Gene Cook. You've been listening to The Narrow Mind. We'll see you on Sunday night for the Atheist Hour.